Recently, I was lucky enough to pick up several small CNC machines at auction. None of them are working. They are old, dirty, and missing some parts. But I got them for a bargain price. This Emco F1 milling machine looks to be complete and even came with a full set of tool holders. The control unit does not boot up, but that's not a problem. It's over 30 years old and very dated. I plan to replace it with modern electronics, which are far superior and take up much less space. There's a lot of unused empty space in the back of the machine, and I should be able to fit everything in there. It looks almost as if they planned to do this originally, but perhaps with 80s technology, they just couldn't fit it all in. But before I start replacing control parts, what condition is the rest of the machine in? The first thing I did was strip the machine down and start cleaning parts. The table had a little surface rust, but cleaned up easily and looks brand new. There are none of the small marks and knocks you'd expect from normal use. The ways are also in very good condition with no visible wear. Even the carbon brushes from the spindle motor have very little wear. All this leads me to believe the machine was rarely used and probably just sat in the corner of a classroom for decades. Each axis is driven by a stepper motor which turns a ball screw through a belt and pulleys. I'm going to change the stepper drivers, but do I need to change the motors as well? Modern ones are much better. But if the machine worked with these ones in the past, why can't it again? Are these motors even compatible with modern drivers? I'd read somewhere that they used five phase motors, which just wouldn't work. The plugs have eight pins, though only six are connected. Could that be five phases and one common? The motors themselves have eight wires and two pairs are connected. This leads me to believe it's a four phase motor and was probably driven in unipolar mode with the center taps grounded. If I just ignore the center taps, I can treat it like a modern four wire bipolar motor. But will it actually work this way? The first thing I notice is that the shaft spins freely, not like a modern motor where you can feel the magnetic detents. This just doesn't feel right. It does spin when connected to a modern driver. But I can stop it easily with my fingers. And it doesn't seem to be strong enough to drive the machine. I'm using a voltage close to the maximum the driver can stand. I also tried rewiring the motor with the phases in parallel instead of series, but it didn't seem any better. How much torque are these motors supposed to have anyway? Despite this being a metric machine built in Austria, a metric country for the last 148 years, the torque is specified in ounce inches. I've no idea what this means since I've always used Newton meters. A typical modern NEMA 23 motor has 1.85 newton meters of torque. So how does two ounce inches compare? That can't be right, surely. These motors exert over a hundred times less force than the modern equivalent. Perhaps the way torque is measured has changed over the years, much like audio speakers. Contemporary design loudspeaker features a more than adequate 2 watts of acoustic energy. Anyway, I always thought I'd end up changing the stepper motors, which is why I have these three new ones. Only they're not a drop-in replacement. The frame size and shaft diameter are the same, but the shaft on the old motor is longer. 
and the pulley is held on with a roll pin through the end. The old pulleys won't fit on the new motors, so I have to change them for these shorter but larger diameter ones. These are held on with grub screws. And since the pulleys are larger, the old belts won't fit either, so I have to change those too. The old ones look in perfect condition despite being over 30 years old, but it's probably a good idea to change them anyway. Now I'm able to mount the new motors to the original brackets on the machine. As the motors are a different shape, I can't refit the old heat sinks and terminal boxes to them. The new motors don't actually need the heat sinks, but they do need some sort of cable protection and strain relief. So I made these 3D printed end caps, into which we'll screw a regular cable gland. They attach to the threaded holes in the back of the motor. I first had to shorten the existing bolts though, taking care to only remove one at a time, since dismantling a stepper motor will cause the rotor to become demagnetized. The original Z-axis motor has an interesting feature. The head of the machine is raised with a ball screw, and since ball screws can be easily back-driven, there's a danger that when the motor is unpowered, the whole head will come crashing down under its own weight. So the motor has a small brake band on its rear shaft to apply resistance when it's rotating in the downward direction only. My new motors don't have rear shafts, so I can't reuse this feature, but I don't think I'll need to. The old motors turn very freely when unpowered. Modern stepper motors have much more resistance, probably more than the brake would add. To drive the stepper motors, I'm using three of these micro-stepping drivers. These are the TB6600 type, rated for maximum 4 amps at 40 volts. These are cheap and widely available. I'm powering the drivers with this 36 volt switching power supply, which can supply 13.8 amps. Now, there are three motors, each with two phases, and they are rated at 2.8 amps per phase, which would total 16.8 amps. So surely this power supply isn't big enough. Actually, it's plenty big enough. I could have used a smaller one, but already had this one left over from another project. Maybe one day I'll do a video on how to choose a stepper power supply. It's not as straightforward as you might think. I'm going to use a small PC running Mac 3 to control everything. In between the PC and the stepper drivers, I'm using a small motion control card. This connects to the PC via a USB port and provides multiple individual outputs for the stepper drivers, spindle control, and also inputs for things like limit switches. The card I'm using is known as the RNR or bit sensor card. I've used these before and found them reliable and they're also inexpensive. The spindle motor is a 180 volt DC motor. That does say 180, it's very faint. So I bought this motor controller suitable for 180 volt motors, which can also accept control signals from the motion controller. I'll link to the various components I've used in the description below. This controller can only drive the motor in one direction. If this were a manual mill or a lathe, either CNC or manual, it would be useful to be able to run the spindle in reverse. But for a CNC mill, I don't think it's really necessary. My other CNC does have a reverse setting, but I've never actually used it. I'm going to mount all the control electronics on this aluminium sheet which will be fitted inside the cabinet. The square of cardboard represents where the computer will go. I want to lay out the components to keep the wiring tidy, with possibly the option to add a fourth axis later on. Well, maybe here. 
I'm using an old laptop for control temporarily, since I don't have a monitor for the PC yet. With the new motors, I'm able to get more than double the original rapid feed rate. But I'll probably limit it to what it was originally designed to do. The machine as standard doesn't have any limit switches fitted to the table. I'd probably be okay with that. I don't have limit switches fitted to my other CNC mill. But this machine's work envelope is less than half the size. And if I ultimately pass this machine on to somebody else, limit switches might be important for safety. With the new motors, running the table into an end stop at full speed might break something. So I'm going to have to add switches. The X axis is easy. There are already tapped holes in the table for the indicator arrows, which I can just reuse. I'll fit this miniature micro switch to the front of the saddle. This one is waterproof, so should be okay with coolant. I had to trim down the pins as there's limited space. I covered them in epoxy putty for insulation. Then I just replaced the pointers at either end of the table with a peg which operates the switch. There's a small amount of adjustment in each one to set the end point a few millimetres before the actual limit of travel. I had to shave down one of the screws slightly as clearance is limited. To stop the switch being triggered accidentally, I made this cover to protect it and also keep it from being clogged with chips. Then I reattached the indicator arrows to the front of it. These show you where the table is within its range of travel. For the Y axis, I'm going to mount the switch behind the column. I can use this red cover which passes all the way through to operate the switch. Fortunately again, there are a pair of unused tapped holes I can use to attach a bracket. The other end of the Y travel is not so easy. This cover passes through a wiper, so the screws can't protrude. I also added a switch on the z-axis, but only at the top. At the bottom end, it's more likely the tool will crash into the table before it reaches the limit of travel. All the switches are wired in series and are normally closed. Tripping any one of them immediately stops the machine. I routed the cable neatly out of the way under the table to the back of the cabinet. Or so I thought. I hadn't appreciated how little clearance there was. No problem. I'll just order a low profile 90 degree cable gland instead. Except. That's a thing that doesn't seem to exist. Well, it does now.
That's better. I'm going to mount this mini ITX PC inside the cabinet to control everything. This measures only about 18 centimeters square. There isn't a convenient way to attach it to the panel, so I made these standoffs. And I'm going to mount it upside down by the lid. The standoffs are countersunk so that when I tighten the screws, the thin steel lid deforms and the screw heads won't interfere with anything inside the case. Here, I brought out the connections for the power switch so I could add a button to the side of the machine. I wanted a touch screen rather than a keyboard as I find it easier to use on a machine and it's also more compact. So I bought this 11.6 inch touch screen monitor. I think this is the minimum size of touch screen that's practical to use with Mark III. And I chose this one because it also has a USB port on the side that I can use to load G-code programs or plug in a keyboard if I need to. The monitor is a generic Chinese one, sold under a number of different brand names. For some reason, they saw fit to name this one BNZ Truck. This looks like it's just a decal stuck on, and it's not even straight. That's better. I made an arm to mount the monitor to the side of the machine. So I can adjust it to the angle I want. and also fold it out of the way when not in use. I added a cooling fan inside the cabinet for ventilation, but when I went to install the completed electrical panel, unfortunately, the PC is now in the way of the emergency stop switch I'd mounted on the top of the machine. I don't want to make another hole in the top. So, I'll just order a low profile emergency I'll just make the standoff shorter. Then it won't be in the way anymore. The sliding door has this bump stop, but the O-ring has either perished or worn out. So I made a new stop and now the door closes without such a jolt. Before I can start making chips, I need to tune and calibrate everything. The repeatability seems to be very good. One division on this scale is 10 microns.
In addition to the touch screen, I wanted to add a pendant for control, so I made this one. Yes, it is <clears throat> 3D printed. But I used 100% infill and also reinforced this hook. Oops, I didn't actually need this hole in the center. But that's easily fixed. I really wanted to reuse the start button from the old controller, but it's just too tall and too easily pressed by accident. So I made a low profile one. The green button is 3D printed, the red one is machined, and I made a vinyl overlay for the other tactile switches. Coiled cables are surprisingly expensive to buy compared to normal straight ones, but it's easy to make your own. I just cut one plug off an old printer cable, wrapped it around a dowel and heated it up until it's just too hot to touch. Once it's cooled down, the coil is set in place, but there's one more step to make this loose coil into a nice tight coil. You have to reverse the direction of the coil. This is hard to describe how to do, but you just twist one end until you feel it flip over into itself, then keep on twisting the entire length of the coil. I would have preferred a jog wheel, but for some reason I couldn't get it to work. The signals seem to be getting through, but Mac 3 just doesn't seem to respond to them. I used the same motion controller on my other mill and it works fine with a jog wheel. I think it might have something to do with the fact that I used 64-bit Windows 11 for this new machine, whereas my other mill uses an older 32-bit version of Windows. Fortunately, I was able to reallocate the pins used for the jog wheel encoder to push buttons. And actually, I might even prefer this setup. Finally time for some actual testing. This is the smallest milling vise I own. It's 4 inches. I have to mount it sideways on the table, otherwise I can't close the door. Even then, the lugs are hanging over thin air, so I can't tighten it down fully. I wrote some g-code to mill a small test piece. Basically a load of stacked squares rotated to different angles.
This is what it looks like straight off the machine. After a second cleanup pass, it looks like this. The dimensions all seem to be accurate. This was going well, but then after several parts, the Y-axis stepper driver cut out unexpectedly. These are cheap drives direct from China. In the past, I bought the cheap ones and also the much more expensive branded ones and found them both to be the exact same thing, except with a brand name stenciled on. Perhaps the brand ones have better quality control, as every now and then you might get a bad one, but it's still way cheaper just to order an extra spare one. Fortunately, I'd done just that, so I swapped the drive out and everything seemed to be running well again. Until the X-axis drive decided to quit as well. What's going on here? Cycling the power clears the fault. So it seems the drive is detecting some condition it doesn't like and is shutting down. There are normally three things that will cause this to happen. Over temperature, over voltage and over current. I'm running at 2.8 amps, which is well below the maximum of 4, so I don't think that's the problem. The heatsink is only getting slightly warm, but I wonder how well the driver chip is attached to it. The chip is on the bottom of the PCB, it's very small. It appears to be bonded to a block of aluminium, and that blue thing is a thermally conductive rubber pad. When the cover screws are done up, everything is pressed tightly together. That all looks okay, so that leaves over voltage as the most likely cause. These drives are rated to 42 volts, though I've seen the same type of drive rated to only 40 volts. I'm using a 36 volt power supply, which I thought would be safely below the maximum, but there might be occasional voltage spikes produced by the motors that are pushing it over 40 and causing the drivers to shut down. I can adjust the output of the power supply. And though it will go up to nearly 50 volts, it won't go much lower than 36. Only to about 32 and a half. This did seem to help, but didn't completely solve the problem. So it may be over voltage causing it, or it may be something else. Anyway, I decided the best course of action was just to replace all the drives with bigger ones. These can handle more voltage and more current. They are physically quite a bit bigger too, which means I have to change the layout of all the electronics. I should be able to reuse the smaller drives on one of the lathes I also got recently. I'll run them at only 24 volts, and the motors are smaller too, so hopefully they should be okay for that. Since I had to rearrange the electronics, I decided to address another issue I'd been having. There seems to be some interference on the USB bus. I suspect it's being caused by the PWM spindle motor controller being too close to the PC. The only symptom this is actually causing is that the sound effect for a USB device being plugged in repeatedly plays on the PC. but it's annoying and could potentially cause problems. So I decided to move the PC and motion controller to the other side of the cabinet. Initially, I wanted to keep all the electronics on the left-hand side, since the other side has these holes in the top. This is where the tool holders are stored and metal chips or coolant could fall through onto any electronics below. So I made this shelf to protect them. I mounted the PC and controller underneath. There's also a panel that goes on the back of the cabinet to enclose everything. These changes seem to fix the problems.
but I still have to thoroughly test the machine, making some actual real parts. So to sum up this rather long video, how much did I spend restoring this machine, and do I think it was worth it? I paid just £84 for the machine in its original state, including auction fees and tax. The stepper motors cost around £40, the controllers for them £35, those were the bigger ones. The power supply, spindle controller and rest of the electronics were £100. The second hand PC was £60, the monitor £95, the belts and pulleys £25 and other small parts £40. In all it cost under £500. However, I was also able to sell the original CRT monitor and tape drive for £135, more than I paid for the whole machine. So in the end, I'm only down less than £350. And looking at what other similar machines sell for, I think it's now worth at least £2,000. So yes, I think it was well worth the time I spent on it.